Hi, my name is Nidhi Flutu and this is the second of a series of interviews for an interdisciplinary project on imitation titled Homo Mimeticus. In the first interview we saw how mimesis or imitation is becoming an important concept for political theory because it helps us account for the effective strategies that leaders, especially leaders with an authoritarian bent, mobilize in, in order to win seemingly democratic elections. In the second interview, we change perspective and consider imitation from the point of view of literary studies or literary theory. Now, the connection is as ancient as uh, the history of literary theory itself, insofar as literature has often been defined as an imitation or representation of reality. At the same time, at the very origin of literary theory, we have in the poetics of Aristotle, for instance, the idea that not only literature or tragedy imitates reality, but also that humans are mimetic creatures. And if humans are imitative creatures, then one of the implications is that we imitate all kinds of models that surround us, either real or fictional, good or bad, and that these models are currently constituting subjectivity in new ways, shaping identities along lines that literary critics and literary scholars still need to consider. Today, I'm here on Deer Isle in the state of Maine, in order to talk to one of the most influential literary critic and theorist of the 20th and 21st century. His name is J. Hillis Miller. He was professor of English literature at Johns Hopkins University. He is commonly associated with the Yale School of Deconstruction, so far as he taught at Yale and was a colleague of Paul de Man, Jeffrey Hartman, and Jacques Derrida and he is currently Emeritus Professor at the University of California at Irvine. Um, we'll be meeting him in his private home, where we'll be talking about the relationship between literary studies, literary theory, and imitation, and I'll be delighted to meet him as he's one of the most influential literary critics of the 20th and 21st century, as well as, for my money, one of the best readers of this period. Here we are, right here. So you're out here somewhere. There are a lot of French uh, place names around here from early French explorers. Ilaho is one of them. Why is it called Ilaho? Because it's rather high if you're coming in from the ocean by ship. First thing you really see as you came you know, way in from out in the ocean would be the top of uh, Isla Ho. <laughs> the local pronunciation is three. Some people say Isla Hut. <laughs> All these names like Detroit. You know, it's Detroit. The United States is full of French names which are almost all uh, anglicized. These two islands. This is Big Freeze. And it's behind the tree. That's Little Freeze. And there's a Small, rather shallow passageway in between. Man, the man is very beautiful, but I thought this was really beautiful. So when we were looking for a house, uh, we found this one in a newspaper or somewhere. Yeah. Where we went to an agent or something for sale. And it came out and I looked at it and I remembered how beautiful I thought it was from here. Here was a house right close to this. So uh, we sort of came home. At once, it was interesting. Uh, there must be underground communication. Once the twin called me, who was everybody, all the people we'd known for so long, a plumber, the, the people who uh, gardened for us and so on, all of a sudden I stopped being Mr. Miller. How did they know? There it's must be some, mimetically. There must be some. <laughs> uh, I think the answer would be that my real, my real métier is for trying to read individual works of literature. And the question of uh, mimesis is bound to come up when you do this. Uh, is this poem or novel direct 
a copy or representation of some piece of history, um, or is it just changed in some way? What's its relationship to the uh, real world? And uh, of what, uh, or put more generally, of what is it a mimesis? What does it imitate? Um, so that that's an issue that comes up, bound to come up over and over again when you're reading uh, works of literature. But not because I say, I start out by saying always, what, what is this poem uh, mimetic? I could hardly not. In my own case, it goes by way of a great teacher I had at Oberlin named Andrew Bongiorno, who was a, from Cornell, and was taught by Lane Cooper there, who was a translator of Aristotle's Poetics, and who thought I had a course with him in which we read Aristotle's Poetics, but Bongiorno thought I should also know the rhetoric. So he set up a thing, it was really, really kind of him, where I met him once a week at his house and drank coffee and ate uh, gingerbread or something, and read another chapter of Aristotle's uh, rhetoric, the poetics I was supposed to know. So how? Uh, so for me, mimesis means Aristotle's poetics, more than the rhetoric. The rhetoric is also a very important book, but it's the definition of mimesis. So I knew I knew it, but I wouldn't say that that my approach to literary study has been primarily by way of the idea of mimesis. It's not. It's been sort of taken for granted. And I thought a little bit about that general question from my own point of view, and I realized that almost universally imitate the uh, some speaker or person or other. That is to say, there's something that intervenes between the reader and direct representation of some poem. It's not that it can't happen, but even poems by William Carlos Williams you know, there's, the Williams is there. It's Williams looking at the bit of lettuce on the on the table. It looks like an objective poem, but it's not simply objective. So for me, literature is mimetic not only of things in the outside world, but also of some subjectivity, imaginary or otherwise, whether it's a persona of the author or or directly the author himself or herself. And uh, so you read literature as much to find out about that uh, imaginary person, because as everybody knows, the narrator of a novel is not identical with the author. But first, let me ask you a question. What is the goal of your five years of work on mimesis? Uh, just besides the great honor of having this money, where does the money come from? The money comes from the European Research Council, which is a funding scheme that was set up 10 years ago. Uh, Europe somehow realized that it's not a bad idea to put money in research. And so my general idea was that my thesis is, of course, this ancient concept that comes you know, from, from the beginning uh, of philosophy and literary criticism in Plato and Aristotle, and that depending on the discipline, it is thought in different ways. So you mentioned Aristotle's poetics as the main model. If I ask anthropologists, they might be interested in ritual dances and magic and the way that a ritual generates a form of participation or identification with a spirit or an ancestor. If I ask someone who works in psychology, he might be attentive to the relationship between the child and the father and the way children mimic parents. Um, and models. So it opens up all these kinds of perspectives. And, um, and the general idea of the project is to try to shift the emphasis from a notion of my Mises understood as a representation of a referential world outside, the one that you mentioned, to a notion of my Mises that has to do with humans as being imitative, which is also one of the definitions of Aristotle in, in the poetic where it says that it's natural for human beings to imitate. Um, so is it natural for monkeys and many other animals 
to imitate. So it's not it's not exclusively uh, human. Uh, how does the baby monkey learn how to use a stick to get grubs out of a tree by watching Mama uh, doing it? How did our we before we put up the deer fence? One of the instigations of this was looking out on the hill out here where Dorothy had some beautiful daffodils and daffodils were blooming and there was the mama deer with the baby deer and the mama deer was clearly teaching the baby deer which were the best flowers. This one is really tasty. This one not so good. <laughs> I think the idea of putting this, this kind of study in a contemporary context is very important because uh, because the notion of life imitating art, etc., changes in a time like ours, which among other things is in the midst of a huge transformation to digital. So, uh, so the function of uh, imitation changes in dangerous ways. If you, if you speak of belief as a kind of imitation, you know, you follow what other people believe. Um, it's much easier now, even than it was before, to believe lies. Uh, because, the, because How can you tell in Facebook or tweet the difference between a lie and a truth? The signs are not, are different and people are not trained any longer to um, tell those. And I, I would think of that as a big area uh, for the study. I can have a ready answer for what it is that novels imitate my Victorian novels, my field. So I'm not so ready with an answer to the question of what video games imitate. There's the role of real life is different in video games. And since millions of people worldwide now play video games, they seem to have a magical appeal. I think that's a thing to study. What is their appeal? What does it mean when you say that a certain picture goes viral that's been simply put up on Facebook? Well, we know what it means. It means that people find it so attractive that they copy it, mimesis it, and pass it on to other people. Uh, and that's much easier to do. A Victorian novel was read by a few thousand people. These viral uh, tweets and Facebook things are read by millions. Uh, why viral? It's a figure of speech. Uh, it's a name for a kind of mimesis. Virus reproduces itself by copying itself, by imitating. So with one virus and pretty soon you have millions that are copied, Im imitated from that first one, have the same structure, etc. We know physiologically how, how that happens. But the, the metaphor is not innocent. It suggests that, the, that it's a spontaneous kind of mimesis that depends on digital forms that are quite different from what we uh, had before. We had to wait quite a while to get a, a something imitated in the 19th century. So there's a, I think that ought to be one of your big interests and topics. And is, uh, it, to me, it's a major change since I'm somebody who has lived through, and I go back to a time when there were radio, there, was, there wasn't even television, uh, much less uh, Facebook and computers. And, they seem to be irresistible. Most people these days live with their iPhones in their hands as if it were part of their own bodies. When I go to the doctor's office and sit there waiting, uh, trying to read my book, I'm a, still a book person, I look around the room, the other waiting patients of any ages, it's not just young people, it's older ones too, they've all got iPhones in their hands or some kind of handheld. And I don't think they're reading Middle March. <laughs> I wish they were. You can.
Middle March, of course, is available in a minute, and it's one of the it's one of the things that makes it possible for me to do research here on Deer Isle because I have access in a few seconds by way of Safari and uh, Google to a major research library. I mean, really major, almost anything. Every Every novel by Trollope is available online. James's novels, all the stuff in my field. So I don't have to have those books. Uh, but also much of the secondary work is also available. Uh, computer, <laughs> such as it is. Reading skills. Well, you would be able to guess my answer. The reading for me was what you call a rhetorical reading that is paid attention to details of figurative language and uh, technique and so on. Why was I interested in those? Because I think it's all too easy to reduce a work of literature to, in the case of a novel, retelling the plot, or in the case of a poem, just identifying the theme, or the scene that's being described. Uh, whereas for me what really is is going on in works of literature has to do with figurative language, with the uh, use of irony, very hard to deal with. I think what we need to do now is to appropriate those methods which were developed for reading and teaching print literature to the new media big deal that's not all that easy to do because a video game is not like a Trollope novel. Um, it, 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 it's a mixture of visual and verbal. There are always words in one way or another in a video game. And I see this as the real challenge now. Why? Because the uh, ideological effect of video game, I'm just to take video games as an example, as well as film, it would be all sorts of other things, is uh, tremendous in determining the way people live and feel. For example, uh, we watch NBC Evening News, and it's, ama it's amazing. It's half an hour. At least a third of it, perhaps more, is ads uh, for things like Prevagen, apparently fraudulent. Uh, that doesn't keep NBC from taking the money to show the ad. Prevagen is for the brain. The, ad, the ads are very clever. A huge amount of the sort of skill that Shakespeare had that went into writing plays now goes into writing ads, yield to no one in my admiration for them. They're very clever. Uh, and the people who perform in them are also very good actors and actresses, and I'm sure they're, they're uh, well paid. Prevagen is a brain medicine, and it is made from an ingredient found only in jellyfish. And then there's a picture of jellyfish. And after you've seen this about 50 times, you forget that uh, New York Times or somewhere ran, ran a story that said Prevagen doesn't work, doesn't do anything for your brain at all. So a third of it is that. The other third is a little bit at the beginning about Trump and um, um, Congress and what they're doing. The rest of it is one scene of violence after another. Policemen shooting, usually minorities, black kids, etc. Horrible automobile accidents. Um, that's the news. The news that people want to see. And the other thing, if you why, try to figure out just what the effect of NBC Evening News is ideologically, the other thing is a constant, relatively subtle praise for uh, war. And I happen to think the wars the United States have been involved in recently were all a mistake. The Iraq war was a mistake. The Afghanistan war was a mistake. 
our involvement in Syria and Yemen, they're all a mistake. Mostly my feeling is of sympathy that these kids sign up and are sent to such places for a war that shouldn't have happened in the first place and get their legs shot off. Whereas the NBC wants to make heroes out of them and to encourage me or my children and grandchildren also to sign up. So it looks like objective news and they tell you at the end more people watch NBC News worldwide than any other news. So it's watched by millions of people. It's not innocent. It's not objective news. It's not imitation of what's really uh, out there. It's, it's very highly selective. Um, and I think learning techniques for studying that and trying to make people aware of it, this is unlikely to happen for several reasons in a big way at least in the United States, partly because this would be done by the humanities and there's a general reduction in support for the humanities. Why is this? There are various reasons, but one of the major reasons is that people play video games. They don't read Middlemarch and there's no use telling them they ought to. Uh, it's not going to happen. So there's, for me, a major shift from print, print media to electronic media, and we should... There's no use wringing your hands, as a lot of people are, and, being, uh, and saying, oh, this is terrible, people ought to read Middlemarch, it's not going to happen. We, uh, we need to, you know, but there, there's a lot of people still read print literature, uh, though mostly probably cur more current print literature. And some of those people with handhelds in the doctor's office are perhaps reading uh, novels. I, I'm not, I feel it would be <laughs> for me to go around the room and say, by the way, I'm making a little survey. Could you tell me what it is you're, you're watching? <laughs> the fact that it often involves a lot of finger work or they're sending their text messaging. I believe it's a often a video game, but not always. It's all up here and down here, and, but it's also alphabetical. This is under D, so it begins with Austin and, and Louis Armand, Bloom on Yates, etc. And this, this house has the literary theory stuff and the philosophy. Yeah, then, then over here is English, some of the English literature, but Joyce and Conrad and so on. You're odd, alphabetically more or less. Everybody says that if you're going to be educated, you should read Shakespeare. Well, okay, uh, Shakespeare is a very great writer. And I was thinking, speaking of, of mimesis just this morning, of a great moment in Shakespeare when in King Lear, one way at the end of the novel, he says, I was in the process of buttoning my shirts, hard to do with one hand. And I remembered this moment when Lear at the end of his life says, pray you undo this button. Very moving. It meant that he was a frail old man, he, was on, he had to have help getting his button undone. Only Shakespeare could. It's just a few words. Very, very moving. I mean, it's terrific. And it is, it is special to Shakespeare. Uh, right? So I'm not, I wouldn't denigrate Shakespeare that pray you undo this button. Meaning that he just wasn't strong enough uh, to uh, unbutton the button himself, and I have some sympathy with that, with these buttons on my shirt, which are not all that easy to do with one hand. But I wouldn't ask Dorothy. Sometimes I get really stuck, and I say, Dorothy, but I don't say it, pray you undo this button. So uh, the, the mimesis still goes on, but it takes radically different forms in the uh, in the new uh, media 
uh, and that's something that I think needs to be studied and to which there will be great resistance because it involves critical, so-called critical thinking. And though administrators are at, on paper in favor of teaching critical thinking, they, not, they don't really think this is such a great idea. And they did uh, the Pew a couple of years ago in 2017 did a study and found that some amazing number of Republicans, 58%, think American colleges and universities are a bad thing. They are teaching people to think. Person, uh, remember, I go back to a Hopkins that had Georges Poulet as a professor of Romance languages, a great reader of, of Poulet at, at a certain point, and tried to read literature from the point of view of uh, of the criticism of consciousness, which still strikes me as a powerful idea that was. Uh, it has its his, history and Poulet's own intellectual uh, heritage, not only in Belgium, but also in France and uh, Switzerland. Uh, there's still lots to learn from him. But I must say that what happened in my own case was that sort of by accident, and I started reading Derrida. All of this is Derrida stuff, and there's some more over there. I thought he was fantastic. In other words, it was not it was not because I'd been told that I'd find him interesting, but I did find him interesting. And I was, you will remember, in those days there weren't translations. I was reading him in French. Uh, and I still think, partly because Derrida is full of wordplay, there's hardly a paragraph or series of sentences that doesn't have uh, some kind of wordplay that depends that's easier to grasp in French than it is in than it is in English. So that it, he's a French French writer, in spite of the fact that, for all practical purposes, he's a world writer in English. In China, 500 people have read Derrida in the English translations for everyone who's read him in French. Speaking of mimesis, I went when Derrida came to start his seminars that he was giving at Hopkins every third year. So I thought I would go around really just to see whether I could still understand spoken French. And it was the mimique essay, a lecture, and I thought it was, and still think, I thought it was spectacular and amazing. I'd never heard anything like it. Sure, you should read Derrida, and I don't, it's probably my stupidity, but I don't know of any current, you know, I've read various uh, um, people who come after Derrida in the area of theory. N none of them have turned me on in the way that uh, Derrida did, so I wouldn't be able easily, you could probably do it better than I, to recommend somebody to read really smart work about video games. <laughs> but what's wrong with Derrida? Now, why, why would one uh, answer, and I've thought about this and looked, he had a kind of prophetic sense of ecological changes and climate change, but it's a very minor uh, feature in, in his work. If there's now a piece of the e is it the eastern glaciers ice in Antarctica, and if this all melted, it's much more rapidly going into the water as icebergs. It would raise the sea level worldwide. I don't know, 60 feet, 160 feet. It would this house would not be around. It would be more clam flats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a literary criticism, in my opinion, is to help elucidate works of literature so other people can appreciate works of literature. The function of literary theory is also, for me, the same. I don't see literary theory as all that great an independent discipline. 
It's got to be about literature. And I think a lot of people have forgotten that. My problem with literary theory in a vacuum, which it really is, is you can say any damn thing you like about literature. Uh, what's the test of whether it's plausible? Examples. You've got to show that it really works. Otherwise, you can say the moon is made of green cheese and the stars are made of an incandescent form <laughs> of green cheese. It's like astrophysics. You assume if you're going to do astrophysics, you need some data from the stars. If you're going to do literary theory, you need some data from works of literature. It may go back to the original training I had in physics, since I was a physics major for the first couple of years, that have gone very deeply into my uh, uh, sense of the way things ought to be. I understand works of literature are not the same as the stars. Nevertheless, I think that literary, literary study ought to be scientific in somewhat the same way. That's why I'm interested in the science of science and the skill of citation. That's right. In order, partly in order because I think that a, a lot of the effects, I think video games for example, inure people to violence and make it easier for people to imagine themselves uh, heroically firing submachine guns and surviving. War is not really like video games. People don't, people die hypothetically in video games, but that's not the same as really, uh, as the player, the player survives. Uh, and that's dangerous insofar as it leads people to imagine that they will sign up for the United States Army and, or the Marines or whatever imagine themselves like in a video game, heroically killing people but not in the end being killed being killed or or being killed and resurrected, coming back back to life again. Yes. It's very hard now since we're surrounded by this new digital culture, it's very difficult. And there would be a lot of opposition to uh, training people uh, to do that kind of critical uh, thinking. Um, nevertheless, I think it's tremendously important. You know, why, why did and will so many people vote for Donald Trump? That's, to me, a big mystery. Because it doesn't take all that much wit to see that the guy is a liar, uh, a narcissist, more than any other American president unfit uh, to be president. Rich Republicans are spending millions and millions of dollars um, in propaganda for the Republican side. And people, it's not that people are stupid, the normal American. Uh, it, it has to have a different explanation. How do I know that? because I know a lot of local people here in Maine who are lobster fishermen, et cetera, who got probably through high school but didn't even go to college and so on. These are not stupid people. It's simply that they've somehow been, something, they watch Fox News and they can't, they think it's true. So that the ability to tell truth from lie Mm -hmm. fake news from real news, to borrow a phrase from, <laughs> from our noble president. Partly the way this happened was through, because, was through manipulation of the vote, because a huge amount of effort has been made to deprive particularly minorities of the vote, to make districts that are going to be certain Republican. Uh, Democrats have done that too. Democracy is capable of being manipulated, and it will be, uh, but it's a, the degree to which that's been done is, is uh, pretty extravagant. So I would say that this, this is a kind of a mesis in the sense that uh, people vo who vote, as the other Trump voters do, have caught a kind of 
a contagion. It's a sort of virus, and it does involve imitation. Uh, it's very hard in an area where everybody else is going to vote for Trump not to copy them and do what they're going to do. So somehow the study of mimesis, I think, is related to the question of how people can get bamboozled. Uh, and the more of that, the better. And that makes me, you know, it, you can learn that from reading novels. Uh, that's one of the big themes in novels. Usually, let's take Middlemarch. Middlemarch really is about Dorothea's disastrous marriage choice. And you say it's as bad as voting for Trump. How did she make such a mistake about this dry as dust <laughs> Casalban? And so it's an example of um, being bamboozled. And the whole novel really is about that mistake and what follows from that mistake and the way in which she eventually marries Will Lattice Law and lives happily ever after. Uh, so you could learn, but I don't think that very many people are going to be patient enough to read Middlemarch for the sake of learning not to vote for Trump. It just, it's, it's too big a jump. And that's why I am a little impatient with uh, uh, scholars that I know not only in the United States, but also in Europe. Ron John Gosch is one of them, who go right on doing literary study as if it were untouched, perfectly safe, really important thing to do. Uh, there is a new circumstance. I think it ought to go on happening, but uh, and I'll go on doing it since it's my my metier, but I don't have the same feeling that it is central to our culture that I used to have, and a lot of people seem to, uh, including uh, uh, quite a number of uh, European scholars that I know. For example, I know and greatly admire a guy at the University of Augsburg named Martin Mitteke. He goes on doing literary study as if there were no problem. Uh, <laughs> because he thinks it's important. I think it's important too, but uh, I don't think it's going to have the... People's, people's ideologies used to be determined to some degree by the study of literature in the colleges or the college of schools and universities. I don't think that's the case anymore. And that change is amazing. That is, what is there so magic about those video games? Uh, and I really don't have a, a very good answer to that. It's meant to be uh, conspicuously naive, this project, in the sense that putting aside literary theory, let me try as clearly and self-consciously and honestly as I can to describe what happens when I read such and such a poem. Or, and that's the part that I'm not sure I'm capable of writing, the, uh, I, so I may need a collaborator such as you uh, to write the part about video games. What happen, What actually happens in my mind and body when I play a video game? Uh, that's not the same question as the analysis of the content of the video game, etc. It's more a phenomenological or psychological question. And uh, that's what my book is going to try, and I want to include. It seems obvious that just to stop with the eights and, and Trollope is uh, not enough these days. And so the project includes uh, studies of the new media. What, ha what really happens when I watch a film? And the shift in interest from literature to film is, uh, to films about works of literature, is uh, 
pretty evident in the works of British literature or American literature, whatever you call James, tend to survive these days in the form of films. I would hope to talk about some of those films too, but ooh, it's a big project. <laughs> and it is, it's a kind of, it's not really directly to do with mimesis, but sort of. Because what ha what happens to me when I read Yeats's The Cold Heaven, suddenly I saw the cold and rook delighting heaven that seemed as though ice burned and was but the more ice. What happen what happens to me is a, a kind of internal theater. The, the, the words of the poem work as a mimetic uh, cue to uh, an imaginary scene, cold heaven, rooks flying around, etc., which exceeds really the poem. Uh, and the same thing is true of uh, novels, where I read a novel, or death scene in a novel, or a scene of courtship. And I have a vivid image in my mind of what the room looked like and what the characters looked like and so on, which vastly exceeds the words. And that's interesting. Uh, it makes the words mimetic of something that's not fully specified. And that, that explains why often my experience of the film, of a film made of a novel, is to say, no, no, you, she doesn't look like that. And it means that I have a very strong image, which exceeds what the book says, of what Dorothea Brooke was like. Etc. And that's interesting. Uh, it, it, it generates a mimesis that exceeds the evidence that I have for it. Um, so, uh, and I think that general. I don't think I'm unique. I think this happens with uh, almost anybody uh, uh, who reads. So I have an image of the characters in novels, which is very powerful and precise. And one of the ways I can tell that my idea differs with the, is the illustrations in Victorian novels, which are, oh, I'd say, no, no, that's not what she looks like. <laughs> How do I know because of this mimetic, strange form of mimesis? I thought we ought to have at least one example of the mimesis. is a poem by Thomas Hardy uh, called uh, Old Furniture. So what could be more, and it really is a poem about old furniture. It's a medic of old furniture. But of course, it's full of, uh, I, I'm finishing an essay, a revised, revised a version of earlier essays called Hands in Hardy and James. And it's a question of the representation, mimetic representation of, of hands in the, Hardy's novels and poems, and then more briefly in uh, The Wings of the Dove. Um, and this, this poem says, uh, I'm not going to read it all, but part of it. Uh, I, I know not how it may be with others who sit amid relics of householdry that date from the days of their mother's mothers, but well I know how it is with me continually. I see this is I see the hands of the generations that owned each shiny familiar thing in play on its knobs and indentations and with its ancient fashioning still dallying hands behind hands growing paler and paler as in a mirror a candle flame shows images of itself each frailer as it recedes though the eye may frame its shape the same. And then it goes on to talk about the clock. He sees a dull, a foggy finger on the clock, setting the clock. That's Seth right. Thomas' clock. Um, I can say uh, And this old vinyl tool, which he can see the fingers playing, and the uh, face that, uh, that makes a spark in a tinderbox. And then he ends a typical 
<laughs> that hearty ending. Well, well, it's best to be up and doing. The world has no use for one today who sees, who eyes things thus, no dim, no aim pursuing. He should not continue in this stay, but sink away. You know, it's time for me to die. It's a relatively late, relatively late poem. So it is. It's it's mimetic. It's a. It really is about old household furniture. It's called old furniture. That's the name, and it came home to me because we have a lot of furniture both in this house, but especially in the Sedgwick house, because it, it's a little less subject to being uh, flooded out <laughs> as than here. We have a lot of old furniture. This poem is mimetic of that. What happens to me when I read it, I think about the furniture of that sort that we have. And as you can see from my reading, it's not all that easy to read because the poems are not rhythmically or literally all that uh, beautiful. I know not how it may be with others. It's not uh, who sit amid relics of householdry. It's not exactly beautiful. It's not like when to the sessions of sweet silent thought. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, I don't know that that's deliberate, but it seems to me probably that Hardy deliberately avoided in his, he, he wanted to give you a sense of this special experience of the old furniture. And he thought if he made the poem too beautiful, it wouldn't do that, something like that. What's also mimetic about this poem, there's two other things. One is the mimesis of the speaker. I don't know what Hardy was like, but the, there's lots about the I here who says, I see the hands of the generations and so on. So that, And I think most um, in literature, most mimesises have some I. There's an intervening subjectivity. It's not just objective description of the old furniture. And this poem would be an example of that. The other thing that's worth mentioning is the way in which the speaker and I think this would be also a kind of a mesis, sees the history written into the uh, objective thing that's imitated. I see the hands of the generations. Um, so it's, uh, it struck me as interesting as both a, a poem that is representational and mimetic in the normal sense. It describes this old furniture, the clock, the old vial, etc., and the tinderbox. These are things that would be in, a, in, in Hardy's house, no doubt, and in houses generally, and correspond to the old things. Not, this part of the house doesn't have much in the way of, old, of any of our old furniture. Uh, but uh, it also goes uh, beyond that, and I think mimesis generally do, beyond what's really physically there, the old furniture, to the way in which the what's really there embodies the past and embodies the subjectivity of the person that's uh, speaking the poem. It's a, uh, for me a very powerful, hearty poem. Not everybody likes Hardy's poems as much as I do. Almost every poem has a, a different and new stanza form. So on the one hand, they're very regular. Each of these stanzas has the same number of lines, ends with a short phrase that's shorter than the other lines, continually still dallying. And it, it ha they all have the same A, B, A, B, followed by a C line. But it's, as far as I know, it, it doesn't exactly correspond to any other poem by, by Hardy. And that's really weird, as though rather than doing what most poets might do, like Shakespeare writing sonnets, they're all sonnets. Uh, Hardy's poetry has a tremendous variety of stanzas. It's all very formal, but it has a tremendous variety of 
stanza form. So, so what? I suppose this is a way of saying this poem expresses a unique mimetic experience and therefore it deserves to be put in a form that's used only once for that for that experience. So it is a mimetic, uh, uh, implicit mimetic argument. Uh, so that's my take this morning on hands and hardy, hands behind the hands, growing paler and paler. So this it happens to be that this is where I keep my own. So all of those magazines have an essay of mine. And uh, this, <laughs> this is Claire Colebrook, who wanted for some reason a copy of my, uh, one of my really early books, The Disappearance of God, and I didn't have one, so she ordered one. And this is her dog, Shelley, sound asleep on Claire Colebrook's copy of The Disappearance of God. <laughs> and she, she's given it a name, she says, Shelley asleep after a good read. My version of that is Shelley asleep after being s bored, <laughs> bored to death. We're off. I thought that this the Swiss Family Robinson was not a work of fiction, but that there it was truth, history really happened. And I was very disappointed because I read it as truth. This is about a family that uh, builds a house in the woods, fancy tree house, etc. It's full of wonderful, it's a wonderful book. But for slightly older people, Alice in Wonderland, though it was full of some jokes that I didn't catch, and there's <laughs> great moments. It's a place to learn puns. It's a great moment where the mouse is telling his sad story, and this story is on the page as a kind of tail shaped and he the mouse sort of loses his way and says where was I and Alice says I think you'd got to the fifth bend <laughs> so she'd been seeing this mouse's tail as a tail ah so there I was being taught puns which Lewis Carroll was very good at taught and I didn't think of I was being taught of anything. I just thought tail, T-A-I-L, T-A-L-E was very funny. So it's a matter of, of funny. And some people wouldn't get the point. Yeah, well, my, it was a thing that I intended to talk about, to say something about, and that is the importance for me of speech act theory and the distinction between performative and constatic language. You could say, roughly speaking, that uh, a, a mimetic document that imitates some real outside world is constative. It's true or false. That such and such really happened. Uh, whereas performative brings something into existence by the words. Alice in Wonderland certainly does that. It bears some relationship to uh, Lewis Carroll's friend's daughter. There's some original for Alice, but it's only some relation, and he wrote it for her. So I wouldn't deny the relation of literature to life. I would just say that it's always very complicated, like the Alice books. The Alice books have a straightforward mimetic dimension. Uh, it's just that you can't walk through looking glasses.
and rabbits in general don't talk. Oh, my boots and whiskers, says the rat, rabbit. I shall be late. Oh, my goodness. The rabbit goes running by. <laughs> and we do see that Alice is a little surprised to find herself in a place where rabbits talk, but she gets used to it. <laughs> it just adds another funny dimension. I also should have made more of the, <laughs> to quote, Paul DeMann's essay of the concept of irony. Irony seems to me absolutely fundamental in literature. But I've discovered that irony uh, in its various dimensions is something that people, that's not the same thing as intelligence. I've had students who were very intelligent, but they just didn't get irony. And other students are not so smart who did see an irony and take pleasure in it. So um, if I were teaching basic how to read course, I'd be sure to have a section which I tried, no doubt unsuccessfully, <laughs> to explain irony. <laughs> now, my dear students, I'm going to tell you about irony. Hubert really likes, and so he's come partly to see whether there's a really is a, a bear down there. And then he sees the pot of honey. He says, I think I better go down there and check and see, make sure it's really honey. And, uh, and so he starts tasting the honey. He says, yes, it's honey. But maybe I better see whether it's honey all the way down. And he puts his head further and further into the honey jar and gets stuck. So he's got this honey pot over his head and then Piglet who's the other main character comes and looks over the side and sees uh, <laughs> Pooh with the honey pot stuck in his head just raising his head and making a loud roaring noise of sadness and despair and Piglet starts running away and says he thinks it's an elephant he says oh half 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 <laughs> Hor horrible heffalump, half half a heffable horlump, and I thought that was so funny. I still do, and I was five or six years old when I read those.